welcome to the Potter's House, everyone. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, we're a cafe, bookstore, and community space that's been here in Adams Morgan since 1960. Um, we recently renovated and reopened this past March. And in this iteration of the Potter's House, we're particularly focusing on supporting grassroots social movements, um, consciousness raising, which is what we're doing here tonight. Um, and we're really excited to have Mark Weisbrot, who is the co-founder of CEPR, which is the Center for Economic Policy and Research. Um, he is also the president of Just Farm Policy. Um, he's the co-author with Dean Baker of Social Security, uh, The Phony Crisis, and you've probably seen um, his commentary and articles in uh, pretty much all um, major newspapers. Um, here in the U.S., probably even more so outside the U.S., because they um, are a little more f friendly towards towards his views outside the U.S. than they are here. So, <laughs> uh, but yeah, we're really excited to have him here tonight to talk about his new book, "Fail: What the Experts Got Wrong About the Global Economy." So, if you could join me in welcoming Mark Weisbrot. Thanks, and uh, thanks for the introduction. And thank you for, uh, I want to thank uh, Francesca for helping organize this, and also uh, Becca and everyone at CEPR who helped, uh, helped organize this. And um, uh, I want to, I don't want to talk too long because I don't really know what everybody wants to know about. This book kind of covers a lot of the ground. There's a couple of chapters on the Eurozone. There's a couple of chapter. there's a chapter on Latin America and uh, one on the IMF, and one on the long-term uh, growth, uh, failure of developing countries in the last two decades of the 20th century. So what I'll try and do is talk about a half hour and then uh, take questions, maybe even less, um, and see what people want to know about. Um, I guess one of the central theses of the book is that uh, long-term economic failures uh, which is a large part of what the book is about, uh, don't just happen. For example, here in the U.S., you have this idea even that uh, the Obama administration saved us from a Great Depression. And, you know, I appreciate what they did do. They had a small uh, stimulus, and obviously we have uh, official unemployment is uh, at least 5% now. It's less than half of what it was back in uh, October of 2009. And, but they didn't, they, you don't get a Great Depression out of uh, just a collapse, even a collapse of an $8 trillion housing bubble. It's a series of really bad mistakes, like you had in Greece. That's how you get a Great Depression, six years. Or, to take an even longer term economic failure, the 80s and 90s in Latin America, where you had uh, 20 years, one of the worst uh, economic failures uh, in the history of modern capitalism. I mean, it's actually rare to have so little growth over a 20-year period. Per capita income grew about 5.7% over the whole uh, 20 years, and it grew over 90% prior to that, in the prior 20 years. And so these are, these are long-term failures, and they're, a set, they're based on a whole set of policy uh, errors that are continuing over a period of time. And then the question is, well, why, why does anybody do that? And that's different in different circumstances, but it's always kind of some combination of uh, misunderstandings, uh, bad policy, and bad people. Um, and so um, you, you know, and, and particular interests sometimes, but not as much actually, and this is one of the things that has always struck me, not quite as much as the left which you you know the left usually thinks of everything as being uh, you know everything terrible at least um, a result of some powerful interest usually corporate interest um, people making money off of it and you know that is certainly true for certain things that I talk about like you know if you look at the WTO or um, the commercial agreements those are driven by corporations they're written by corporations. Uh, they are <laughs> corporations, and uh, but a lot of other things are not. Um, a lot of other mistakes are just mistakes uh, that people make because they don't understand. Uh, so even people in, in high positions 
don't understand the economics. You have this, you know, a, or you have this powerful ideology, like in the United States, where we have the dollar, and uh, it's the world uh, main world reserve currency. The central bank can print money, and we could use it if we wanted to. You know, even Larry Summers said this just a few uh, month or two ago in the Financial Times. The U.S. Uh, or central banks in general could create money and use it to s just spend it. You know, it's free. You know, he didn't talk about borrowing. He said, create it and spend it. This is the former U.S. Treasury Secretary, not a leftist. Okay? Most economists know this, but the public uh, doesn't know it, and the politicians don't know it, and the politicians are also afraid uh, of the public to do something that bold. We're, in a sense, lucky that we had someone who was as open-minded as Ben Bernanke in the Federal Reserve. If you compare it to what the European Central Bank did, after uh, the world recession, you can see why they have, uh, that's one of the reasons at least, that they have uh, twice the level of unemployment that we have today. So uh, again, you know, I, I try and, and, uh, and in the book I try to look at, you know, how do these mistakes happen and, and how do they persist for a really long time when they really shouldn't, uh, even, um, even from the point of view of the people in power. You know, in the Eurozone, for example, it's common to look at this as, well, this is a struggle between bankers and the people. And it is true, the bankers got bailed out, uh, you know, in, in most, of the, most of the debt of the Eurozone <coughs> countries has been shifted uh, to the, the, the taxpayers of the Eurozone. And uh, on the other hand, if, we, if they were just looking out for the bankers in Europe, um, they would wouldn't be in this mess today because they could have uh, fixed uh, Greece back in uh, 2009 when the debt was 115% of GDP and for a very, very small amount of money, a tiny fraction of what even the bankers have lost, uh, uh, not to mention the taxpayers of Europe, um, they could have fixed the mess in Greece and gone on and they could have had a uh, they could have had a recovery like we had in the United States. You know, this was the epicenter of the world recession, right? This was the U.S. Uh, housing, $8 trillion housing bubble that really started it off. You had huge bubbles in Europe, especially in Spain and the U.K. But nonetheless, this was it. And we had a recession, and it lasted 18 months. And then the economy began to recover. Europe had an additional, uh, they had the same, about approximately the same length recession. And then they had another two years. So why did they have to go through that, and why do they have twice the level of unemployment that they have today? And this is a question that I, I, I try to answer. Other people haven't answered. A lot of people have written about the failure in the eurozone and what a, you know and how uh, you know irrational it is, and and, and also how uh, tragic it is for the people of Europe. And by the way, it's not just Europe; it's the world economy. It took a big chunk out of world economic growth as well. So it hurts people in Africa and, and other countries as well. And uh, so why, why did they do this? Well, if you look at the statements of the European officials and you look at uh, what are called the Article 4 agreements, these are papers that the, each government, member government of the IMF, uh, does with the IMF, where they go through their economy and they look at it and they make policy recommendations. And it's kind of a consensus process with the finance ministry of that country and the, uh, and the IMF. If you look at those papers, you see that they actually had a political agenda. And this political agenda is why they had the extra two years of recession. This political agenda is why um, they couldn't do what was even what the United States did uh, to get out of the recession. Uh, and what was that political agenda? Well, we went through uh, 67 of these uh, papers. Uh, thousands of pages. Um, these were agreements with uh, then uh, 27 European Union <coughs> countries uh, from uh, the four years, 2008 through 2011, so included the world recession years and the crisis year. And you can see um, a very systematic pattern in these papers. They wanted to, the recommendations are to uh, reduce the size of the state, cut uh, overall spending, cut health care spending, cut pensions, uh, reduce uh, eligibility for unemployment compensation, uh, 
change labor law as they did in Spain and Greece and they tried to do in Italy um, <clears throat> to make it more difficult for unions to bargain uh, collectively, especially nationwide. And so they had all these things that they wanted, they being kind of an elite consensus of the, of the, the European uh, finance ministries and politicians. And yeah, of course, some of the, the private sector is, is, is also part of this too. But it was a political agenda. It wasn't just getting money for the banks. And it wasn't just stupidity, although there was a lot of that too. It was actually they wanted to use and prolong the crisis in order to force these uh, governments, the more vulnerable governments of Europe, Spain, Portugal, Ireland, uh, Greece, Italy, to make these reforms that people would never vote for. Okay, That's what you see. And you see it uh, very clearly. You can see it in these agreements. Uh, you can see the statements in the agreements. They even have statements like saying that you know recovery from the crisis is the best time to make these changes uh, because they can see that there's a vulnerability, there's a chance, it's an opportunity for them. They present that, and you also see it very clearly in the actions of the European Central Bank, which, uh, as I said, deliberately prolonged the crisis uh, for about two years in 2011 and 2012. And so it wasn't the financial markets, as a lot of people believe. The financial markets, uh, it wasn't the financial markets that caused this financial crisis of the euro. They were only able to do that because the European Central Bank wouldn't do what a central bank normally does, what the US Central Bank does. Act as a lender of last resort, back up the bonds of the biggest Eurozone countries, which was Italy and Spain. And of course, uh, they didn't do that. And so they repeatedly went to the edge of financial meltdown, prolonging this crisis, prolonging the recession until uh, July of 2012. And then uh, the central bank, the president of the central bank, then uh, Mario Draghi, finally stood up and he said, we're going to do whatever it takes to preserve the euro. And all he had to do was say those three words, and that was the end. Uh, you can look at the graphs of the yield on the 10-year bond for Italy and Spain. They went straight down all the way to today. Uh, they didn't even move very much when Syriza was elected in Greece. Um, and I want to get back to that a little bit, too, because I think that's an important uh, episode in the European story. So you see, they had the ability to end that part of the crisis at any time. But they didn't do it until they either got what they wanted or got as much as they possibly thought they could get, and they got tired of the near-death experiences. So uh, that is a story, I think, of Europe that hasn't really been told, even though if you ask anybody who's followed this closely, uh, they will say that, yeah, that was a huge, uh, huge part of the story. And, um, so that's one thing that I really wanted to get out in that book, because the politics is really, really important. You know, let's look at the case of Greece just for a minute, because there was great hope, including on my part, when the Syriza government was elected and took office on uh, January 25th of this year. And this was the first government. You know, the, you know I should say that the Eurozone is a, is a real structural problem, OK? So you know, you have crises. Crises are part of capitalism. And you know uh, they're recurrent, and you know how they're dealt with depends on a whole set of political uh, and economic conditions. But the eurozone is particularly uh, it, it has its own characteristic in that these countries lock themselves into a an agreement where they gave up their sovereignty, they gave up their national sovereignty over their most important economic policies. Monetary policy, including interest rates. Um, exchange rate policy, because they don't have their own currency. And then, when they got into trouble, they found they didn't have control over the, even their fiscal policy. That was controlled by people who had their own political <coughs> agenda and didn't necessarily care if a quarter of the population of Greece was unemployed. And so, uh, or 22% in Spain. 
or uh, again, you know, over 10% Eurozone wide. Now, that's a really big thing. To me, that should have been the lesson. <laughs> you know, if you're going to give up sovereignty, we all have to do that, right? The US is even going to have to give up some of its sovereignty if we want to solve the climate change problem. That's international uh, cooperation. You give up sovereignty. But that's very different from turning your economy over to people who really don't have your interests at heart and, in fact, have an antagonistic set of interests. And that should have been a huge lesson. And I want to emphasize that, and that's why, you know, um, uh, it was, I think, mentioned just before I spoke um, that, you know, the book, this book is more popular, and what I write is more popular in the rest of the world than it is in the United States. And that's because the rest of the world understands this immediately. Okay? <coughs> it's only really in Washington where you get the idea that sovereignty isn't important, because the United States is, you know, it's the empire, right? So why should it care about sovereignty? Sovereignty is basically an obstacle to US foreign policy in general. So, so you know, even when I presented this book at the World Bank, or the uh, similar uh, discussion at the Inter-American Development Bank, they are not radical institutions. People get it, you know? And, uh, but here, it's very hard, uh, because the, you know, the dominant uh, idea is that, um, you know, sovereignty doesn't really matter. And so I say that because that's why, you know, one of the reasons I wrote another chapter on the, on the IMF, because that was the most powerful avenue of influence of the U.S. in, in developing countries for, uh, you know, the period between the 1970s and the 2000s. And that was, the, you know, more than the Army and the CIA, you know, and the military. In, in my opinion, uh, but at, for, at the very least, it was more power, it was the main influence on economic policy in, in developing countries. And that was lost. In the 2000s, they lost that, they lost most of that power. And, you know, you wonder why, why do I have to tell you this? Why didn't you read about this? Because nobody here really talked about what the IMF was doing. You know, the IMF was and still is run by the U.S. Treasury Department, okay? It was an agreement that was made uh, back in, uh, when it was created in 1944. And um, now that's not true right now. At this particular moment, that's not true for Europe. In the European countries, the, they let the European directors decide uh, what they do in the Eurozone, okay? But, um, <coughs> In the rest of the world, that's its U.S. Treasury that decides. The developing countries have little or no uh, voice. And so uh, this is an example of where sovereignty was hugely important because uh, when they lost that ability in the 2000s in middle-income countries, it gave middle-income countries a whole uh, new space that they could uh, move in that they didn't have for uh, at least 20 years. And I'll give you an example of Brazil. You know, for example, they, you know, in 2002, when President Lula da Silva was running for office, the IMF came in and uh, sat down with him and his opponents and said, okay, uh, this is what your macroeconomic policy is going to be for the next couple of years, regardless of who wins the election. And, uh, and they said, okay, it was a $30 billion loan. And there was a lot of capital flight and uh, somewhat of a crisis at the time because uh, of the prospect of Lula being elected. And uh, so, so they agreed. Now that it doesn't happen anymore in the middle income uh, countries for the most part. I mean, almost completely. There's a couple of exceptions. I mean, Ukraine is middle income, for example, and they, they're, they're getting, uh, they have an IMF agreement. And ironically, now you have high income countries. <laughs> which is, again, just a very particular, that's Euro, the Eurozone, which you didn't have for 30, 40 years. You didn't have high-income countries taking orders from the IMF. That, that's a very, uh, that's a new uh, situation. So again, that was a very important development. I would argue that it's the most important change in the international uh, financial system uh, since the collapse of the Bretton Woods uh, system in, in, in 1973, the system of fixed exchange rates tied to the dollar that we had, um, you know, uh, 
from the post-war uh, period, the post-World War II period. And again, I don't think I've even really seen an article about it in the major uh, press, other than the ones that I've written. Um, and a few other, a couple other people um, have, have noted it. But nobody wants to talk about it, because then you have to say, okay, well, then, what, you know, what was it like before this? Well, before this, actually, the IMF had kind of a creditor's cartel, where if you didn't sign the IMF agreement, you didn't get money from the World Bank, or the Inter-American Development Bank, or other regional bank. You didn't get money from the Paris Club. You didn't get money very often even from the private sector. So it was a, it was a very, very powerful instrument because of this creditor's cartel and this uh, gentleman's agreement. You know, if you look at it historically, um, it's an interesting thing. It, it shows how the power of this inertia and why, uh, why governments always uh, often think they have to create new institutions when things change instead of trying to reform uh, the existing ones. I mean, why, you know, um, uh, 70 years after World War II, the end of World War II, you still have this informal gentleman's agreement that the head of the World Bank is a, an American and the head of the IMF is a European. You know, that's not most of the world. It's not even uh, most of the world economy anymore. And, uh, and so I, I think that's, you know, an important part of it. And new institutions have been created. So Latin America is another part of this story. And it's a story of sovereignty. It's a story of changes in economic policy that were long overdue and really necessary. And it's a story uh, also of, it's a hopeful story actually, even though you wouldn't believe it from the news of the last couple of months. Um, it's a story of, you know, of what countries can do when they uh, break away to some degree uh, from this system. So why don't I say a little bit about that, and then people, we can, we can go into any more uh, details we want. Um, the reason I think the, you know, uh, the Latin American story is important, and, and it gets very little attention, you know, uh, and it's understandable. I mean, even on the left and the peace movement, I mean, what are they going to pay attention to? They got wars all over the Middle East. They got things that really matter. And again, if you look at it from the elite level, of course, you know, uh, they don't care either because it doesn't have electoral consequences uh, in the United States. So <coughs> that's, I think, the main reasons why you don't hear about it so much. But it is a very important development. This region that was controlled. Uh, by the United States uh, for, you know, way more than a century, and they have now this kind of second independence. And I won't go through that whole uh, story, but let me just give you a, a few summary uh, statistics and, and facts, and then say something briefly about, you know, what's happened very recently. So, what really happened in Latin America is that, you know, uh, until 1998, uh, most of the left in Latin America didn't even think it was worth uh, running for uh, trying to uh, win the power electorally because they couldn't in the past. The United States had intervened so many times. Most of you here probably know this history. Uh, you know, Chile in 1973 or Guatemala in 1954, Nicaragua and El Salvador in the 80s. They had intervened so many times to either prevent or uh, left governments from coming to power with a lot of enormous amount of violence, as you all know as well. Uh, and, uh, and they, um, uh, either to prevent them from coming or to get rid of them when they, when they did come to power. In fact, Chavez, Hugo Chavez himself, when he ran in, uh, in 98, uh, he didn't want to do it. He thought it wasn't worth it either. He had to be uh, convinced uh, by other people that this was worth it. And then. You know, some five, eight, nine years later, he was telling the, the, the FARC in Colombia to lay down their arms because you don't have to do this anymore. Now we can win uh, and we can compete in, in elections. So that was, the, that was part of the sea change that uh, took place in Latin America. They elected left governments because they could uh, for the first time. And it was just one after another. Once uh, Chavez won, uh, 
the domino theory was kind of uh, true in that in that sense. You know, uh, you know, Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, uh, Paraguay, uh, Bolivia, Ecuador, Honduras, uh, El Salvador, Nicaragua, and so uh, this all happened because uh, they were able to do it, and it happened as from the uh, other, I think, major cause was the, um, the, the, the long-term growth failure, that thing that, that, that 20 year period that Latin America has never had in more than a century uh, of uh, very little uh, economic growth. And so uh, what did they accomplish? I mean, the, the, the most important thing is they reduced uh, poverty. You know, uh, from um, uh, during the, the 2000s, the latest number is for uh, 2013. They reduced uh, poverty from 44 to 28 percent of the region, and that uh, that's the the whole region. And uh, and that was compared to the previous uh, you know period where poverty actually uh, increased. Uh, so that's the you know the most obvious part of it, and and then. You know, I go into detail in some of the countries uh, how what they did, how they were able to do it, how it related to the political freedoms that they had and the economic choices that they could make that they couldn't make before I mentioned Brazil. But there was also, for instance, Ecuador. They had a whole set of financial reforms that I would love to see in, in the United States and most of many people here, including Elizabeth Warren, are, are fighting for. They really took control over the... Uh, the banking system in terms of regulation. They forced the banks to repatriate uh, money that was held abroad. That they had what was called a domestic liquidity requirement. And uh, so uh, the, uh, the amount of uh, uh, money that they had to hold that it, it nearly uh, doubled. They took control of the central bank. That went against, of course, the whole neoliberal orthodoxy that central banks are supposed to be independent which really means independent of, of public accountability, not so much uh, independent of the, of the bankers. Um, and they engaged in a strong uh, expansionary uh, fiscal policy during the downturn. So they minimized the, you know, during the world uh, recession of 2009. And a number of countries did that. Bolivia had the highest growth in the region during that period because they had a big, you know, over 5% of GDP uh, stimulus. Ours was about 0.8% uh, uh, if you take into account the, the state and local governments. And so you had a number of these, you had counter-cyclical uh, policies. In Bolivia, they took over, renationalized their uh, hydrocarbons industry, which was already the majority of their exports and a huge part of government revenue. And there, in the eight years of Evo Morales' uh, tenure, uh, which was a huge thing anyway because it was like the end of apartheid. It was a country with a 60% indigenous majority that had, you know, very little voice before Evo was elected. Their hydrocarbon, government's hydrocarbon revenue went from 731 uh, million to over 5 billion. And that enabled them to do other things, to stabilize the currency the whole time, for example, to uh, greatly increase public investment to uh, lower the retirement age, where it's being raised all over the world. Okay, Ecuador too, increased uh, massive <coughs> investment in housing, investment in uh, transportation. In Venezuela, uh, during this period, and they, you know, they get the worst name of anyone, of course, here because they have the oil. So the United States really, if you look at each one of these countries, the US intervened in all of them uh, in, in various ways against uh, the left governments. They succeeded in getting rid of the, uh, helping get rid of the government, uh, the president of Paraguay. They really uh, succeeded, and Hillary Clinton acknowledges her role in this, in, in making sure that the democratically elected president of Honduras could not return to office when he was uh, overthrown in a, in a military coup, uh, for example. And they uh, made trouble in Bolivia <coughs> and uh, Ecuador as well, but only in Venezuela, which has the world largest oil reserves, uh, did they actually uh, help support a, a military coup and still, uh, and, and then stepped up funding to the opposition after that. Uh, 
And actually, there's just some documents I saw that were just released today on the Freedom of Information Act that showed that in, in a run up to this latest election in Venezuela, the U.S. stepped up their uh, funding for, uh, for electoral processes, processes and uh, parties and, and things like that. So um, I'll, I can go into more uh, detail on this, but in all of these countries, you had policies. Bolivia is a perfect example. They could never have done this. They were under IMF agreements continuously for 20 years with just a nine-month uh, uh, break uh, before Evo Morales was elected. So they could never have uh, they could never have renationalized their hydrocarbons, and they couldn't have done all the other things they wanted to do. Ecuador, of course, they had to, they defaulted on, on a third of their foreign debt as well as everything else they did. They all had to go against this uh, Washington, this power uh, from Washington. And uh, I should mention again, in Venezuela, there were, uh, in fact, remarkable successes, and even though the economy's been in recession, uh, for the last uh, year to two years. Uh, the majority of people are still much uh, better off because they had growth. If you look at the, you know, they didn't have any, they had negative growth per capita for 20 years before Chavez was elected. And that's why they still, even in this, even with the economy being a mess right now, you know, I would say that that's why they still got 39% uh, of, of the vote because, you know, people's lives are, are still better with all the shortages and the inflation and the recession. Uh, they're still better now for the majority of people than they were uh, before the government uh, got control over its oil industry. And, uh, and you can look at this again uh, statistically in terms of anything. We don't have statistics for the last year, but you can go through 2014 and you can see uh, the the reductions in poverty in, in that 10-year uh, period were quite large, it was about half. Uh, for example, in extreme poverty, uh, more than that, and you had a, a tripling of, of uh, post-secondary uh, education, uh, a huge increase, about triple also, in the number of people uh, over 60 receiving pensions. So these are. Uh, uh, these are s major improvements, and again, that's a country where, if you read the press, you never even during the, you know obviously the news is all uh, bad now. But if you look at Venezuela during the boom uh, period, uh, it was still all bad news in terms of the media. It didn't change that much when the economy ran into trouble. <laughs> they didn't have to <laughs> do a big rewrite <laughs> of their basic story, and. Um, so uh, that's the thing, you really do, you know, the media is the last thing, I'll, I'll just mention that, you know, because um, it's not just the media in the United States. The media that these uh, governments face internally is, is amazing. Uh, if we had that kind of media in the United States, Obama never would have been elected because most of the country would have believed that he was a Muslim and was not born in the United States, which is believed by a large percentage of Republicans. But nonetheless, it's not a large, a huge percentage of the general population. And this is the kind of media that you have, that Brazil, that Dilma has to face every day, that the Argentine government had to face uh, for 12 years, and um, now they have somebody friendly. Uh, and uh, Ecuador, Ecuador did something about it. I mean, all these governments tried to do something. Ecuador, actually, when they took power, uh, the banks owned almost all the TV stations, and so they passed a law. I remember talking to someone from the government who came here uh, right after the election. I said, can you do anything about it? I don't know. I don't know what we can do. And then they passed a law saying banks cannot own media. Uh, they can't own TV stations. And so they don't own them anymore. And that made a difference. Uh, they also took a couple of TV stations that uh, people who were in exile who had left the country during the last financial crisis and uh, owed a lot of money. Uh, so they took those stations and made them into public uh, TV. And so anyway, that's part of the battle as well. But uh, I do think, uh, I'll, I'll end with this there, uh, you know, in terms of, again, and I can get into details of the recent events in the question and answer, but uh, even though the whole Latin American region is now in recession, and you have this narrative now in the media that uh, 
well, the populism, you know, never was going to work anyway, and it's all dead now, and the leftists, you know, we finally got rid of them, and so on. Uh, uh, I don't think it's like that. I think there are very permanent structural changes that have been made. People have a taste of what democracy and economic policy uh, looks like, sovereignty looks like. And most importantly, the simplest, uh, from the very simplest democratic uh, point of view, if the governments don't deliver, they, the policies can change which in, the, in that 20 year period leading up to uh, these left governments, the policies really weren't decided uh, uh, necessarily by the, by the governments, like in the Eurozone, okay? Those governments, you know, Tsipras said, I was gonna do X, Y, and Z, and then he didn't. <laughs> and he came back to the people and said, sorry, I couldn't do any of these things, I couldn't say no to austerity. And uh, so, that's kind of the position that Latin America was in uh, prior, and it's much worse uh, for developing countries uh, for a whole set of reasons. So I'll stop there, and uh, and we can have some discussion. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks very much. This is very interesting. I understand what you mean when you say uh, capitalism breeds crises, it's part of the game. I understand what you mean when you say some of the cure is just to turn on the faucets and you can print money and that's basically free. It occurs to me that the political posturing and, and those goals play a big part in terms of why that doesn't happen. And of course the international trade plays a part in as much as a country can't just exist in and of itself. What do you see as the other big reasons that, that are, why is the pain still so much longer than it has to be, both from the economic and social standpoint? Yeah, that's a really, I mean, that's a big question. It's a sociological question and an anthropological question and, and an economic question. Um, I mean, it's very different. The answers are very different in different countries um, because it's, a, it's, it's an institutional problem. You know, you want to look at the United States, for example. I mean, there is some progress. You know, if you go back 20 years in the 90s, when Alan Blinder was uh, appointed voice, vice chair of the Federal Reserve, and he made the political mistake of saying that the Fed has a mandate under the law, which is true, to ensure full employment, <laughs> you know, the media and everybody came down so hard on him that he had to walk back from it. Now. So you could say there's progress today, right? It's now acknowledged. The Fed, the chair of the Fed says we have to care about employment, you know? And they're holding, they've held interest rates at zero. So, you know, so here's one, why is that? Well, you actually have grassroots organizing now, uh, and that's significant as well, around the Fed. You didn't ever have that in my life, okay? Because people didn't understand it. It was the, you know, the, the, yeah, they have no idea that the Fed is really determining the, the rate of unemployment in the United States. And that in fact, when they raise interest rates, they're deliberately throwing out people out of work. It's not a, even a side effect. They're doing it in order to create more unemployment. And the theory is that that will bring downward pressure on wages. And, and then the, the theory is that that will lower inflation. And so um, those things were unknown. Uh, they weren't unknown among the people who, the elite, who agreed with the policies, they were just unknown uh, among the people who were victims. I think that's a big part of it. I mean, you know, uh, that's why I think economics education is so important. And I know most people don't like it. You know, you write any book like this and it has a limited audience. Even Paul Krugman, who loves to write about economics, if you read his columns, you'll see that most of them are about politics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he's probably discovered that it has a much larger audience. But I think that's part of the the story as well. It's, it's a lot like any other political change, too. In some ways, it's, it has similarities. You know, why do we still have these wars, for example? There's a whole institutional analysis you can give of that as well. And some of it would be very similar. But some of it, in the case of economics, does have to do with a, a, a lack of public understanding. I think if the Europeans, for example, the European left of center uh, uh, population, uh, understood what the Eurozone was, they never would have uh, allowed it to pass. And of course they did, they voted down in some countries and they made a vote again until they got it right. 
And, uh, uh, but that's part of it too. That was too long an answer. Go ahead, somebody else. Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, I want to follow up about the Eurozone, because I think you know, you're exactly right that there's a fundamental strategic um, flaw at the whole concept of the uh, single currency. But what, what, what to do now, and I think it is interesting, because if you go to Europe, you know, you have a lot of people on the left, progressive, who see, you know, holding on to the Euro, the European community as an essential political project that is partly about, you know, dealing with the far right and so on. And can, is it possible at this stage to um, disconnect the Euro as a currency from the European Union as a <coughs> project? Yeah, I definitely think it is. Uh, I absolutely think it is. Um, I mean, there were people who made this argument and still do. I was just at a conference where one of the leaders of the Portu uh, parties in Portugal as part of the left coalition was making the legal argument saying that if a country leaves the Euro, they have to leave the European Union. I, I don't believe that at all. I mean, all of these legal questions are politically determined. The European Central Bank did a whole bunch of things that it wasn't allowed to do uh, by law, but who can stop them, right? And, you know, if Greece had left the Euro, for example, they would not have been kicked out of the European Union for the simple reason that, well, especially the United States, which has intervened in that country uh, quite a bit in the past uh, 70 years, you know, with a lot of bloodshed to make sure that, that would never, they would never end up outside the European political alliance. And so, Nobody's going to break up the European Union just to punish somebody uh, for leaving the Euro. I don't think it would ever happen. Uh, so I do think, I would like, you know, you know, Varoufakis right now has a project, right? He's a former finance minister of Greece under Syriza. And he's going around Europe because it's the logical thing to do. If you're not going to leave the Euro, uh, you're going to have to reform it. So he's going around Europe trying to do that. I think that's very, very difficult. I don't blame them for trying it because, you know, they're stuck in this situation now. I mean, that government, uh, they gave in. I'm not sending anybody to hell, you know. You could argue, for example, that Tsipras did, I mean, that he had a, a, a constituency, his voters didn't want to leave the euro. Uh, that's what the polling showed. I mean, so, uh, on the other hand, you know, now they're really screwed. They have another year of recession at least, according to the projections, and those projections have turned out to be uh, wrong for almost all of the last six years. And they're transforming the state into something that's going to be a lot <coughs> less merciful uh, for poor people and working people than it used to be. And so, uh, but, I think it's so clear now after that struggle in Greece that uh, they're not going to change. And it isn't just Merkel and it's not just the Germans. It's that project. They have a project. They really believe in this project. They want to change Europe into something more like the United States where poor people are really a lot poorer and have a lot less protection and labor is much weaker. And why should they give up on this project? You know, if Spain or Italy threatened to leave, then that might be another story. But they wouldn't do it, uh, they weren't going to do it for, well, you know, we could go into more detail on that. I actually thought that, I think they actually did have bargaining power because of the U.S. I think that the Obama administration was definitely leaning on Merkel very hard. And they still are, right? You have a split in the IMF. The IMF won't go along with the last bailout agreement. And that's U.S. government, that's Treasury saying, look, you guys got to have some debt cancellation because we don't want this crisis to keep happening because the U.S. doesn't care about the European neoliberal project, okay? All they care about is the unity of Europe, which is their main ally uh, strategically <coughs> in the world. So you do have that split, and I think the Greeks could have taken advantage of that because the U.S. would have leaned much harder, but the problem is they made it too clear uh, once Obama figured out that they were never going to leave, they didn't care anymore. And the Germans just went ahead and crushed them because they knew they weren't going to leave. So I think that the, that the crisis, the, the, the most obvious way 
that Europe can, the fastest that they can return to reasonable levels of employment is going to be somebody leaving the euro. If not, there is a there is the long-term uh, process of trying to transform the eurozone. Yeah. yeah. Who is your take on sovereignty? Uh, what is it exactly? A lot of people don't even know what it means. Yeah. Well, I guess the simple idea of sovereignty is that a, a nation, you know, has the right to elect its own government and determine its own uh, its own policies uh, without the intervention of, of foreign uh, powers. And, you know, I didn't even mention in this, uh, it's a part of the book actually, but um, now that you bring it up, you know, China played a, a, a major, a significant role in this loss of power of the IMF and the United States in Latin America by providing an alternative source of currency and, and lending and investment. And China, for all of its uh, Problems. I mean, because they do, for example, try and get uh, the countries they loan to to buy Chinese goods and things like that. But they uh, have a very uh, strict policy of not interfering in the internal affairs of the governments that they deal with. Even weak governments like in Africa, they don't actually try to uh, to uh, you know change the government. Change, force a change of government. They don't try, uh, they don't try to tell the country what their macroeconomic policy. Or human rights policy. Or human rights policy, that's right. That's part of their idea of sovereignty. And, uh, but I think as a package that's a more positive thing than the United States, which uses human rights uh, primarily as a political uh, weapon. And, uh, and also, um, uh, and then at the same time, decides that all of these policies which the rest of the world considers to be the sovereign right of nations are something that they should have the right to determine. Who is next? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, first I'd like to do something non-intellectual, emotional, <laughs> and thank you for, for uh, uh, raising your voice always. Uh, for reason and for understanding in terms of uh, Venezuela particularly. And I think your, your voice has been important because there was nobody else out there, you know, uh, that, that could do it and you, you stepped in and you have done it. Uh, I have a question for you, maybe. Uh, the, the project in Latin America, what you call the second independence, uh, was, uh, mainly within the bounds of, of, uh, of dependent economies, right? Dependent countries. And really what they, what they have done is to, to be honest about, about what uh, uh, they could do within the limits of, of the nation states or whatever, you know, within dependent countries. And, and that's why <coughs> they're so hated by the elites because they demonstrated that, yes, you could do many things if you had the good will to do it. And that all the other stuff were just excuses, and they didn't really want to do well for the people, they said. Uh, but uh, in terms of the economy, in terms of the, that project, you know, like ending its life cycle, which is what people are saying, what did they do, what can they do now? Or what would be like a long-term prospect? Because just redistributing the wealth that you get from raw materials, I don't know if it's a long-term prospect. Yeah. Well, let me answer that. First, I want to preface this, though, because a lot of people, again, you know, since you've only heard more bad things about Venezuela, you know, you have to remember that, um, and, and, and you've said that, you know, there hardly anybody else saying it, you know, sometimes when everybody has a consensus view, it, it's wrong, okay? And, uh, you know, I mean, we spent the first uh, several years at CEPR saying that there was no crisis in the Social Security system in the United States. And everybody, including Democrats, told us you couldn't say that because, you know, you just can't say it. Nobody will believe you and they won't take you seriously. And then by 2005, you know, uh, when Bush tried to privatize, then everybody adopted our view. Uh, 
And so it's, it's very important to keep that in mind, that you, know, you really have to look critically at these things. And that doesn't mean that everything they say is wrong either, right? Venezuela right now, for example, does have serious economic problems. So I'm going to address the question from that point of view. What could they do to fix these problems? Well, I have argued for some time, and there's a, a section in the book about it, that the fundamental problem, economic problem for Venezuela right now, even more than the collapse of oil prices, uh, is the exchange rate system. And so in other words, they have a fixed exchange rate, and it's very overvalued. It's 6.3, and then some of it is given away at 10. That's the domestic currency, the uh, Bolivar, to the dollar. And uh, so, in other words, they're giving away currency at a tiny fraction of what it's, or a small fraction. It's not tiny, but it's a small fraction of what it's really worth. And you can't do that. It's not sustainable. And so, uh, and you get what they've gotten is called an inflation depreciation spiral, where uh, the shortage of foreign uh, currency and the distortions causes inflation. And then that uh, causes the black market exchange rate to uh, get worse. So the black market is over 800 now. And uh, whereas, you know, back in the fall of 2012, it was only at 12. Okay. So, and then that feeds back into inflation uh, because some producers and importers are going to the black market to buy their dollars and then they have to raise their prices. Uh, even if they're, you know, being totally honest, they have to do that. Um, so, and then that determines the prices in these markets. And so it feeds back. And this has happened in Latin America in the past. And so what could they do? Well, the first thing they have to do is, is uh, normalize the exchange rate system. They should, it's not going to go to 800 if they float it, okay? It's not going to go anywhere near there. They need uh, a realistic exchange rate because this is a mess. Uh, and then they can start to try and, and bring down inflation. You can't do it while they're caught in an inflation depreciation spiral. Um, the next thing they would have to do is um, they'd have to get rid of some of the price controls. I mean, gasoline now, if you can buy a gallon of gasoline in Venezuela, if you take a $1 bill and change it on the black market and buy gasoline, at the retail price, <coughs> and take it across the border, and, and you could actually sell it. You wouldn't do it exactly this way because they're a middleman, but if you actually sold that, uh, that dollar's worth of gasoline in Colombia, it would get you $6,000, okay? So you can't have those kind of distortions. The incentives, uh, the arbitrage, the corruption, the stealing is just too great. It's one thing when you have a 50 or 80 percent differential like Argentina has between the uh, official and the black market. It's quite another when it's you know tens of thousands of percent. So um, this is the this is the, so those two things have to be fixed. If you look at the amount of revenue that they get even with oil at 45 dollars a barrel, that's enough to pay for their imports. So they don't have to go through a, a terrible uh, recession like Greece did to, in, you know, to reduce their imports by, by a third, you know. Uh, they don't have to, uh, the adjustment shouldn't be that hard. In fact, they can cushion it. They can borrow uh, internationally. They borrow from China right now. But the problem is the money ends up going right out of the country because there's such a huge incentive to take those dollars and not uh, use them uh, for imports but use them, uh, you know, uh, just to make a fortune through arbitrage. And so uh, that's, those are the main things that I think they would have to do to fix uh, the economy, and I'm hoping they will do it soon. Next, yeah. Um, you were talking about Venezuela's fixed rate, but other countries in South America don't have that same issue, right? Yeah. And it seems like a lot of the social welfare programs that were spurred by high oil prices are now kind of slowing down. They're not able to finance them in the same way. Um, how are these countries going to get by with lower oil prices? And kind of as a counterexample, what has Uruguay done to avoid some of these 
economic downturns that other countries have experienced? Well, not all these countries are dependent on oil or hydrocarbons. I mean, uh, you know, it's really just uh, Ecuador and Venezuela and, uh, and uh, Bolivia. And Bolivia hydrocarbons are, they're on a fixed contract and it's gas, it's not oil, and so it doesn't, they don't get quite the shock uh, that, say, Ecuador or Venezuela do. But so far, none of these countries have, I and mean, there's other commodity prices have fallen as well, and so they're hit by that too. But, you know, uh, none of them are in a crisis because of that. <coughs> I would say even Venezuela is not in crisis uh, primarily because of the fall. Because the, the inflation depreciation spiral started before while well, oil was still $100 a barrel. So uh, I guess this is part of the thesis of the book. I argue that there are always feasible alternatives. I mean, almost always. You know, sometimes, obviously, if you, if you really get hit with some kind of shock uh, that prevent, and you can't borrow, you know, Argentina, for example, still can't borrow on international markets. That's a real handicap. Uh, but overall, no, this isn't, the main, this isn't the main problem. In Brazil, the reason they're in recession is because the government uh, did kind of what Greece and Spain did. They had uh, policies that made the economy slow and made the recession worse. Go ahead. Yeah, I was wondering, like, following that thing with the larger policy, what kind of effects the new elected government in Argentina have in Hungary? Macro is saying that probably as the American Supreme Government was sanctions in Venezuela and just yeah. Yeah. like in the region itself, how much influence Argentina will have. Yeah. Okay, so probably some of you couldn't hear that over there. She's asking what would the what's the impact of the of the uh, the new the election in Argentina, they elected a right wing uh, president. Well, uh, and he's already, first thing he said was he wanted to suspend Venezuela from the South American trading bloc, Mercosur. And, um, well, first, you probably didn't see the news today, but he backed off of that. And he's no longer supporting the suspension uh, of Venezuela. And that was, I think it's pretty clear, it's because he sat down with Dilma and she laid down the law, the president of Brazil, and said, no, this is not going to happen. Right. And wanted to just shut up about it, if you want to have good relations with us. And so you see, he was doing this for the United States. He's very loyal to the United States. But that's why I say this is an example. The region has changed. You can't get away with that uh, anymore like you used to be able to. So I don't think he's going to have that effect. Uh, I don't think he's going to transform Argentina. Because first of all, he doesn't have the Congress. And secondly, you also have institutional and political changes in Argentina where people don't want to go back to the old way. They voted him in as a protest vote. And because he also had a very sophisticated public relations campaign where he packaged himself as a progressive and not uh, a neoliberal. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he is pretty flexible. I mean, as mayor of Buenos Aires, you know, the nominal uh, budget increased six and a half times in seven years. So... Uh, even adjusting for inflation, that was pretty big. And so it's not clear what he's going to do. But I don't think he's, I mean, it's, it's, it's unfortunate for the region to have uh, a president who's more loyal to the United States than he is to, you know, the Latin, his neighbors, and maybe even his own country. If you look at the WikiLeaks cables, I, I wrote about that, uh, the things he said in there, you know, he was, he was asking the United States to come down harder on the Kirchner's and their own government, that they were too soft, that they were being abused by the Argentine government. But I don't think he's going to be able to do very much if he wants to be a successful uh, president as of, as of right now. Um, okay. okay. Can I just add one little detail? Because it's, it's kind of interesting. Uh, when, he, when he walked back from his remarks about Venezuela, he said it was because Venezuela had a clean election. And he was one of the worst people out there trying to say that Venezuela wasn't going to have a clean election. <laughs> And so he used that as an excuse. But if you look at what he actually said when he wanted to suspend uh, Venezuela from Mercosur, it had nothing to do with the election. It was others. It was human rights. Okay. So the election did. You know, he was just using that as his excuse to say. And that was quite a travesty too for him and the, the Secretary General of the OAS and all these people to say that Venezuela was going to cheat in this election. 
you know, because they all knew, I mean, they've had all these elections, they had 19 elections, they never cheated once. You know, this is something, this shows you how people don't understand this country at all. I mean, this is a matter of pride, of an identity for the government, okay? They very <coughs> proud that they vastly increased the voting population, that they came up with this electoral system that's one of the most secure in the entire world, and they are not going to cheat in an election any more than they would denounce socialism, okay? And so that was just a, a, a bunch of hype. Okay, next. Okay, so I don't want to blame the victim, um, especially as a progressive, but um, following the Twitter tubes and commentary by Latin American elites who look, I think they kind of cobble together political economy with economics and uh, will look at um, certain anti-democratic moves a step too far, which I'm inclined to agree with, but I, at the same time, I don't want to make the mistake of cobbling it together with economic or, or more economic policies in those countries. Um, where I'm going with this is, uh, do you see there as being a fracture in the Latin American left, and do you see there as being maybe more constructive forms of leftist policies? and less constructive forms of, of leftist policies that do deserve some criticism and should not be replicated in other countries. Yeah, I think there's a lot of criticisms you can make for all the governments, mm -hmm. and I've made them. I mean, in Brazil, I just mentioned, I think their macroeconomic policy has been wrong since 2010, and that's why they're in recession now. And, uh, and, I, think, and I just mentioned the whole set of policy mistakes in Venezuela. I didn't mention the ones in Argentina, but I think they made some as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but they had, you know, kind of the best uh, track record for the 12-year period, I think, in terms of really using uh, unorthodox economic policy to really raise people's living standards and reduce poverty. So, but, and again, they have more of an excuse than anyone else because they were cut off from international financial markets. And then they got hit again last year when this you know, really incompetent New York judge made a decision to take all 90% of the creditors of Argentina hostage in order to feed the vulture funds, okay? And so they were on their way to being able to return to uh, international financial markets, and that would have kept them from any kind of balance of payments problems that they're facing now, and they got screwed uh, by that. But, you know, a fundamental, another criticism that a lot of people have made from, uh, the, from a progressive point of view is that the, none of these countries did very much to diversify away from their uh, primary product exports, whether it's oil, hydrocarbons, uh, soybeans, uh, wheat, uh, you know, orange juice in Brazil, cattle. Uh, and I think that's true. They didn't have the kind of industrial, they didn't make moves towards the industrial policy well, they made some moves. Uh, Brazil and Ecuador in particular, they made moves towards industrial policy. The only thing I would say uh, in their defense is that it takes a long time to do this. I mean, you know, those of you who, read, uh, who have read Hajun Chang, who wrote the preface uh, for uh, my book, um, you know, know that it took uh, Toyota 30 or 40 years before they had a car they could sell profitably on international markets. So it's a long, development is a long-term process, and you've had this long period of neoliberalism where countries abandon these uh, industrial policies. They don't even have necessarily people available with the skills and knowledge. So it's hard, but I'm not, I, won't, I, won't, I won't make that much of an excuse for it. I, I, I want to say that they should take more steps, and they're going to have to. I think they're going to have to because they're not going to compete with uh, China and the Asian countries on the basis of uh, cheap labor, okay? They're going to have, these countries are all going to have to find some kind of niche where they can produce something internationally and for their domestic markets to the extent that they open them, and they have opened them a lot, uh, that they can produce, uh, you know, a given uh, <coughs> level of productivity and cost that is, uh, is uh, reasonably competitive. And, you know, Venezuela, you could argue, has the longest time period, or they did until the price of oil started falling, uh, because they have, you know, enormous reserves. But uh, nonetheless, yeah, that, that's something they're going to have to deal with. And, 
and I, I think they, I hope they will. Yeah, go ahead. Um, it seems that almost all of your discussion is that capitalism is okay, but we, you know, we have to change certain policies, change certain leaders, change certain directions, and we'll solve the problems of poverty, of unemployment, of all these of wars and crises. I don't think you ever get to the point, maybe the problem is more fundamental and than that, and therefore we have to really think about an alternative to capitalism. And well, these governments certainly would agree with you, uh, all of them. I mean, you know, they do, uh, uh, Bolivia, Ecuador, Venezuela, the Argentines didn't talk so much about socialism, but they were actually among the more uh, radical in terms of their economic policies. Um, so I, I have focused on these policies because I'm looking at it historically and, and politically within the period that we're looking at. Um, so I'm not trying to, the, I mean, the book I write is not trying to project uh, forward. Uh, I, mean, they all, I mean, they're all engaged in commodity production. They're all, they're they're all produce something. Yeah, and they're all working the within a, a capitalist system and they're responding to the failure of that system for a 20 year period. And they're trying to, uh, well, if you talk to these presidents, they also, and their political parties, I mean, what's MAS in Bolivia is called Movement Towards Socialism. It's not like the socialism in France they're talking about either. They want socialism. So I'm not dismissing that argument at all. I'm just saying that, uh, you know, they have to get to some stage where they can uh, have a stable economy under capitalism before they can uh, transform it into, into something else. Because it's a, re why it's a reform uh, strategy they're doing. It's not a, it's not a revolutionary uh, strategy like, say, Cuba, you know, where the government uh, takes over the entire economy and, and tries to make it run. And I think part of the argument would be they don't have the capacity for that at, at this time, even though, uh, again, some of these parties and presidents do, do believe in that as a goal. Who's next? There was someone. Oh yeah, David. Um, I, I'm, I'm wondering about, um, it seems as though the, the, the last, I don't know, the recent past has had some setbacks in Latin America, uh, Argentina, Venezuela, uh, I think Brazil also. Yeah. Um, and I, I find it a little bit worrisome, and I'm, I'm curious to know if you're, I, I'm sure, I haven't read the mass media, but I'm sure they're just crowing about how there's, you know, there's this, this blowback, and it's the end of, of these progressive governments, blah, blah, blah. But I, I, whatever they're saying doesn't really matter to me. I'm just, I'm just concerned about whether there's actually, there is a trend, there's a, sort of disenchantment or just the voters are getting tired of socialist policies or you know, ostensible socialist policies? Well, you don't really, uh, I don't think there was a backlash against that. I don't, you know, I mean, if you look at the elections and you look at the polling data and what people say, uh, the two elections that were lost, you know, in Argentina and uh, in Venezuela, it was just a, it was a parliament, it was a congressional election. And by the way, I don't think that changes, that necessarily changes that much because it could be, and most likely will be, something like Obama with a Republican Congress. You know, it's a presidential system. So it doesn't necessarily change anything. But uh, I think this is, you know, they're punishing these governments. I think you, you have a protest vote. You have people that are unhappy with the present situation. In Venezuela, as I said, they have triple digit inflation, they have a recession, and they have major shortages that nobody else has of these consumer goods. So people waiting in long lines, they're pissed off. So they vote, you know, uh, so they stayed home. Actually, that's, the, from what I can tell, it's mostly two million Chavistas stayed home, and the opposition turned out in numbers comparable to the presidential election. I don't think there was that much uh, of switching sides. Um, and you, uh, in, in, in Argentina, I don't know, uh, you know, exactly what happened, but you can tell, yeah, people were, uh, again, they were, it was, a, it was a protest against the government because of the inflation, uh, 
and the relatively slow economic growth in the last couple of years. Um, they have maintained fairly high levels of employment. Um, and the exchange controls. So, yeah, but I don't think, you know, I think very few people, you ask them, would you want to go back to the Argentina, not only of the, the depression before the Kirchner's, but uh, even the Argentina of the 90s, the only economy was growing uh, quite a bit, but unemployment was very high and poverty was much higher. Uh, I don't think they would say they want to go back, and I don't think you would even find that in, in, in Venezuela, despite the severity of the current economic crisis. I, I think that's what I said. I think people's, uh, it's partly that people already had these values and they couldn't vote for them in the past. And then they also changed uh, with the you know experience of a uh, something more of a modern welfare state. Mark, I think we got time for about one more question. Okay. Go ahead. So, with the increase of automation and offshoring in the U.S., sending domestic jobs away. Uh, if there's a downward pressure on wages and diminishing in power amongst labor, has there been a historical precedent where a country has gotten to the point where its, its power elite and its, its heads of corporations no longer have a base of consumer to support them? And if so, what happens? Um, I don't know. I don't think you really have that. Yeah, I don't think, I, I think that I mean, there is a problem that a lot of people have talked about it, you know, in the United States that the worsen, worsening uh, income distribution has contributed to what some economists are calling secular stagnation. So it's kind of a version of the story you're, you're telling, you know, that uh, too much of the wealth is accumulated at the top and it's not spent here. Um, but overall, I don't think that's the main problem. I think mainly what we have is a you know is in the U.S. is a is a it's a it is a secular stagnation problem, uh, but it isn't primarily driven by income distribution. Uh, it's more there are other things involved, other imbalances uh, involved in it, uh, which since it's the last question, I won't have time to go into, but I'll, I'll, I'll have to talk to you about. It. It's in the book. <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, thanks for running. You can read it in the book. <laughs> well, we just want to thank Mark. Thank Mark again for coming out. Thank everybody for coming out. Um, there are books um, up on the front table. You can grab one, have Mark sign. You can bring down the sign for a second, Mark. Or sure. Yes, you can have Mark sign it, and then you can purchase them at the bookstore register at the front bar. Um, feel free to kind of hang out uh, in here and continue the conversation. Um, wanted to end it just a little early to make sure that folks had time to talk. Um, we close at that's nine, fine. so that's like 30 minutes. So. Okay.